Hi everyone and welcome to the DevSecOps track. I'm Denise Murtha Dunn, a volunteer in the OWASP community and currently OWASP Dublin chapter lead in Ireland. I'll be moderating this today's session. During the next 45 minutes, you'll be listening to Bjorn Kimenich present all about the OWASP Juice Shop project, which is an interactive, insecure web application training environment. For any questions you may have, please submit them during the session in the Q&A tab just to the right of this video on the Whova platform. I'll then be asking Bjorn your questions in the last 10 minutes of the session. Please note that the chat function in Zoom is actually disabled for attendees, but you can leave comments and chat using the chat tab in the Whova app or online. So just to introduce Bjorn, this Bjorn is currently an IT project group lead in Kuhn and Nagel, responsible for application security. He's very passionate about security and application security, which is really evident through his volunteer work with OWASP, where he is an OWASP life member, chair on the OWASP committee, OWASP dupe shop project leader and co-chapter leader for the OWASP Germany chapter. So with that, I'm gonna hand you over to Bjorn. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a busy OWASP, so to say. So I will start sharing my screen. Please tell me if it works. Does, okay, perfect. So yeah, welcome everyone to this uh, introduction session about the OWASP Juice Shop. Um, I will start from the beginning for those who've never heard about Juice Shop before and who have, might have never seen it before, but I will go in, in more detail only uh, for some uh, into some let's say of some of the newer topics that we just recently added so even if you had like a few years ago maybe an intro session to do shop there should be still something interesting in this for you so we are currently at version 14.0.1 with juice shop because we take semantic versioning very seriously so whenever something breaking changes in the application we actually pull uh, uh, in increment the the actual major version of the of the platform so let's start. Uh, so the tagline of JuiceJob is it's probably the most modern and sophisticated insecure web application, although it's by now uh, in its eighth year. So it's not that new anymore, but we keep it up to date. And so I I hope that the modern, most modern uh, tagline still, still applies. And I would guess so. Most sophisticated definitely applies. And you will see why when I'm, uh, when you, during the presentation. So um, here are some customer testimonials that I actually collected over the years. None of these are fake. So the links to all of the original tweets and everything you can actually find there. So it's, uh, it has been called the most trustworthy online shop out there. Might be a kind of ironic statement here. The best juice shop on the whole internet. That's very, that's very kind. Um, it's actually the most bug-free vulnerable application in existence because we actually care about our code base and try to make sure that the application itself actually works the way it should be, but it's still massively vulnerable, of course. Yeah, first it makes you laugh really hard, then it makes you cry when you actually see what, uh, what happens behind the scenes and what actual technical issues and security issues are in it. And uh, the wife of one uh, colleague actually complained when she saw it that this actually has nothing really to do with Jews. And she was kind of sad about that. So starting with the first demo, this is what I always like to do, show you what the Jew shop actually can, uh, can do and what you, can, uh, what you can use it for because it's an actual e-commerce application where you can purchase, surprise, Jews and associated products. So when you start the juice shop, this instance here is running locally on my computer at the moment. You basically get this um, this overview here of products that you can that you can actually buy. Um, so let's see what what does it have. It also has this lovely cookie banner. Well, I, I will I will leave that open for a bit. Uh, so let's show a few more products here. So as you can see, there's all kinds of different different juice you can actually buy. Here, for example, some lemon juice. Okay, very nice. Um, but also some some uh, merchandise products. Uh, for example, there's coasters with the juice shop 
uh, wallpaper background, unfortunately, those are sold out at the moment. Or there's, I don't know, for example, our, one of our favorites, uh, actual temporary tattoos, which you can really purchase if you want. And those have even been reviewed by someone who's who seems to be really into tattoos. So you can see there's lots of stuff here. Um, so I'm I'm already logged in from a previous session, it seems. So let's log out. Now you can see I cannot put anything into my shopping basket, but of course, that's what I actually want to do, right? I want to do the happy path shopping tour. So I have to log in. Um, when I'm a new user, I actually would have to register, right? Classic uh, way of doing this. I will for to not spend too much time with this part uh, of the of the presentation, I will just use our our demo user. So log in. And uh, now you can see I'm logged in with the demo account. And now I will just purchase some stuff like, for example, a little bit of apple juice, maybe also some lemon juice. And I might actually want one of these melon bikes, which look really cool. It's expensive, but it looks great. So now I'm going to my shopping basket. So I can decide, okay, I want a little bit more lemon juice, maybe even more apple juice. So let's increase those a little bit. And maybe this melon bike is a little bit too expensive for me. So I will just throw it out of the cart again and we'll proceed to checkout. As the demo user, I already have an address. So let's just use that one. Um, I can choose a delivery speed. So yeah, it's only juice, so I'm fine with standard delivery, so it's free, but it might take actually five days to, to reach me. Let's continue. And now I have to obviously pay. So I could either use my already registered credit card or I can use my um, in-store digital wallet, right? Because I have 200 credits, whatever currency this is uh, on, my, on my wallet. So let's use that to actually pay. I will not get any bonus points. Okay, that's sad, but now I have completed my purchase. Uh, I'll get some confirmation here. I actually can, if I want see the actual invoice, which is generated as a PDF, can download it, store it, print it, whatever I like. And I can already even go to the order tracking page here and see when my um, delivery will arrive, right? So it's currently, as you can see, still in the warehouse, five days away from my home. Lovely. So this is obviously the main juice shop use case because we want to sell you stuff and want to make money from that. Of course, there are some side use cases as well. So for example, we are always happy to receive customer feedback, right? So if you just want to give us some some credit for what we are doing great or maybe even not so great you can you can you can do that you have to solve a really complicated capture to actually submit it because we don't want to get spammed too much if you're not so happy you can of course also complain uh, you can even upload your invoice with the order um, that that the complaint is about so we are not so happy to receive those but yeah we we take them anyway if you have a question, you can ask our friendly uh, support chatbot. So um, my name is Björn. Hi, Juicy. Okay, so I can ask Juicy all kinds of questions. So for example, how much is apple juice? Let's see, maybe Juicy knows. Ah, Juicy tells me now how much apple juice costs, but also how much lemon juice and apple pomace costs. Okay, well, it didn't get that product exactly. So I can also, for example, ask Juicy uh, some, some other questions, but this is actually part of the hacking experience already and I don't want to spoil too much. There's a photo wall where you can upload your favorite photos from your uh, experience with products that you purchased at the juice shop, for example. There's an About Us page where you can read everything about the exciting history of the juice shop uh, company. You can also find all our social media links, et cetera, et cetera. You can even become a, per a deluxe member um, for the, for the uh, amount of only 49 whatever currency um, 
to for one year, so you, then you actually get free fast delivery, for example, and other benefits. And in your account, there's even more features, right? So you can get to your order history, you can change your addresses, you can read our privacy policy. You can even, if you, if you want, you can even set up two-factor authentication, right? So, and I guess nothing bad would ever happen from me showing this uh, QR code on, on, a, on a screen and having that actually recorded somewhere. So you can see there's lots of stuff you can actually do with this application. So that was the, the actual happy path, right? So if you just want to play around with a web shop, this is actually what you want to do. And you might not have noticed that there was actually nothing going wrong here, right? And nothing really looked that suspicious or was broken. So it's actually working. The only thing that doesn't work is you will not get whatever you order because there's no real um, company behind this that will send you the stuff. But everything else now works quite nicely. So of course, as Denise already mentioned, this is actually a training environment for, uh, for web application uh, vulnerabilities and uh, general problems with, with secure design and everything. So the juice shop contains a number of 100 hacking challenges from all kinds of categories, from technical stuff like cross-site scripting, SQL injection, that kind of thing, but also wrong usage of cryptography, um, the, the inability to prevent automation attacks and complete uh, security design disasters. Also using in secure components. So basically you find everything in the Jew shop that you will find on the OWASP top 10, not only the current one, but also the one from the, let's say I would, I would almost say like from the beginning of the OWASP top 10, everything that you found ever had on that list is probably already in the Jew shop. Um, these 100 hacking um, challenges or exercises uh, are ranked into six levels of difficulty. So starting from beginner friendly ones with one star going all the way up to six stars. So as a beginner, you should find enough things to do, but also as a, as a security expert, there are some tough nuts to actually crack here. And when you actually hack the juice shop, um, the juice shop will notice when you succeed in uh, one of the 100 challenges and will tell you so and collect your progress or save your progress on, a, on our scoreboard. And actually finding the scoreboard is usually the first challenge that people have to solve. And uh, you might have noticed, I didn't close this, um, this welcome banner. Oh, let me go to the starting page here. I didn't close this banner uh, because I actually wanted to click on this button, right? So I would like to get some help to actually get started with the real use cases of the juice shop. When I do that, I will now see this, let's zoom in a bit, this friendly little bot here with the face mask for safety reasons. Um, that will give me some advice what I actually um, need to do, right? And it tells me, okay, first thing I need to do is finding, finding the scoreboard. Okay, so there are no links directly leading to the scoreboard, unfortunately. So, okay, so now it tells me I could either just try guessing the URL, uh-huh, or let's see, double click to proceed, or I could try to find out something more about um, the available pages in the Drew shop in the development tools of my browser. So that's a nice, nice hint actually. So let's see. Um, and now it tells me, okay, please try try that out. So I will try to do it with the dev tools. So let's see, where do I find the source code of this application in my browser? So it's probably here in the source tab. And you can see, this is actually the index HTML page. And that only has like 30 lines. So this must be some really sophisticated application or there are some really long lines if that if this whole application functionality fits into this short index html well actually the the real source code of course lives in javascript files these here right so runtime polyfills main js so let's see so the main js is actually the the real client side code 
and it's all in a single line with almost 400,000 characters. So this is not really easy to read, but luckily Chrome comes with a pretty print, print function. So now I'm actually having like 14,000 something lines of JavaScript, which I can go through. So let's see, I will just do this little trick here, searching for score. And it finds a few hits, which don't really help me that much. Let's see, <laughs> scoreboard challenge, app scoreboard, title scoreboard. Ah, this looks good. Paths, right? Here's a list of paths the application knows. And there's a path scoreboard being mentioned. Okay, so I'm happy to try that. Just go to scoreboard. And yeah, that did it, right? So now I actually found the scoreboard of the juice shop. Uh, Juicy congratulates me. I can close this now. I get a notification here on the top that I actually solved a challenge. And I already see here in that I actually solved this challenge successfully, right? And here you can now also see that there's lots of other challenges available in the application. And you can filter in any way you like, right? So you can exclude show, uh, solve challenges. You can, uh, for example, only show the easy ones or whatever, or just uh, maybe focus only on cross-site scripting. So it's basically filterable in any way you like. So that's the basic functionality. Um, maybe just for fun, maybe we can do one more actual hacking challenge. So let's see. Let's pick something that is that shouldn't be too hard. Like let's take a look at the available cross-site scripting challenges here. You can see there's quite a lot easier ones and harder ones. Let's see. I think there's even a six-star cross-site scripting challenge. We will not try that one because that would take longer than an hour. But let's go with one of the one stars here, for example, DOM XSS. Perform a DOM XSS attack with this payload. Okay, I will copy this payload already. And now in the, I, I basically have two um, options, right? So I can just try it on my own, or I could again launch one of these tutorial scripts and then the little bot would again help me um, to actually solve this, right? But I, in this case, I think we don't need that because one of the most classic places for cross-site scripting issues is search functionality, right? So when I'm searching for orange, I find everything that's related to oranges. Okay, that's good. But I also get this, um, the search string on the top here, right? So, and I could now see what happens if I play around with the search string a little bit, like for example, doing something crazy, like adding some HTML around it. And you can see this already had some had some influence, right? So let's see what happens if I add a horizontal line, I actually see the horizontal line, right? So it seems that the input here on the top is not properly encoded when it's being put into the HTML. So it actually just does what I tell it to do. And that might also include JavaScript. So I will use the payload from that I copied from the scoreboard in this case, which should now give us a little alert box. Alert box. And when I submit this, you can see here's the alert. I can close this now and I will get confetti again and this notification here on the top, right? And if I now go back to the scoreboard, you will see that I actually solved this challenge, right? So that's that's basically it. So and you can do that for the remaining uh, 1898 uh, um, hacking challenges on your own now, if you if you want. But there's of course more to be found in the juice shop. More things you can do with it. You could start the juice shop in our so-called tutorial mode. So here it will only show you the uh, challenges which are which have this kind of uh, uh, helper bot tutorial, right? Where this little, little, um, our little juicy bot actually tells you what to do. It gives you some hints. It will 
first only give you the one star challenges. So you basically have four tasks you can you can complete. And once you completed these four, it will basically unlock the two star challenges with tutorials and so on up to the three star ones. And so, and only when you have solved all the tutorial challenges, it will then unlock the entire scoreboard, right? And you can basically continue in, in uh, open world mode, so to say, and just do whatever you like. This can be quite useful when you know that you have a, a group of students, for example, and uh, they have no previous experience with this, and you'd want to prevent that they just start doing something crazy with challenges you they might not be prepared for yet. Right? So this is a very nice beginner-friendly uh, feature. We also have uh, something to help you uh, as a trainer, for example, or especially as a trainer or teacher, to um, find out if your your uh, the users are actually seriously trying or if they are just copying solutions from the internet or just uh, cheating with some tools and scripting things. So behind the scenes, the scoreboard is measuring how long it takes uh, a user to actually solve a challenge. So we have some estimated real minimum time that we expect a challenge to, uh, to be solved in. And if you are under that time, then you get a, a cheat score assigned, right? And then it will uh, basically calculate over all challenges how likely it is that the user actually cheated. Uh, that is quite nice. This is absolutely invisible to the to the actual user. So uh, unless you look at the you look at the console. So here in, in this case, on my local computer here, right? So for the for the first scoreboard challenge, it actually tells me it took uh, 53 minutes since I started the server. Okay, so zero score zero cheating points. Uh, for this cross site scripting challenge that I did afterwards, the time difference was three minutes between finding the scoreboard and actually successfully exploiting the XSS. Expectation is it takes at least one minute. So if I would have done this in like five seconds, I would now get a certain score for cheating assigned, right? And this is actually how it's how it's how it's done. And these um, this information is also available um, to to other systems via some webhook that I will I will explain later. So we also have one feature that is still quite new, which is called coding challenges. So whenever you solved a hacking challenge, like we just did with the cross-site scripting, for example, you can try to, for some of the challenges, there's a subsequent coding challenge available where you can, where you should try to find out why this problem actually exists. And this is something which I would also like to show you. And let's pick as the example our just solved uh, DOM XSS attack, right, on the search field. So if you click this button here, it will open up the, the coding challenge um, screen. And the first thing you have to do is actually find the line or multiple lines, which are responsible um, for, this, for this vulnerability. So let's go through this. So there's some filter table functionality here that takes some parameter from the query. And if that query parameter exists, it will trim it. Okay, it will put it to lowercase. It will save it in a, in a field called search value. And it will then do some stuff with it. And that's almost it, right? So this seems to be what happens on the client side to actually filter the search result. So this is not nothing happening on the server, but on the client. So my guess is that this line looks a little bit wrong, right? So bypassing security and trusting HTML sounds exactly like the, like the thing that causes this problem. But just for fun, let's pretend I have no idea and I really think that Trimming might actually be the worst thing you could actually do here. So let's select line four and submit this. And it will now tell me that this was wrong. Okay, so maybe it's not trimming. Maybe it's uh, actually getting this parameter in the first place. So let's select this one and I submit this again. And now because I submitted two wrong answers in a row, I get a little hint telling me, okay, 
maybe maybe you should look into uh, into this. Okay, yeah, but I'm sure. It, I mean, it really must be this. Maybe it's maybe it's these three lines in total. Let's submit this again, right? And now I get another hint. And typically we have like up to three hints. And if you still don't have it right, then you will just get uh, being we you will just be told what line exactly it is, so you, that you never really get completely stuck. Um, but of course, I know that this line six is the problem here. So let's select it, submit it. I get confetti again, and I'm now in the second stage of the coding challenge, which is actually finding a proper fix for the problem. So here, the application is offering me four possible fixes, and it will give me this nice uh, diff overview here of the code difference, right? So here the recommendation is in the first fix, okay, remove this line and instead use security trust resource instead of HTML. Okay, so let's check line two. Here it says, just use the value as it is. Okay, that looks boring, but well, let's check the other options. Trusting scripts instead. Uh -huh. And number four, trusting styles instead. Okay, trusting styles, that doesn't seem to make sense. Maybe trusting scripts, that, that, that looks reasonable. Um, if I want, I could also just uh, remove the noise of the original code around this, right? By just showing the change lines, or I could use the side-by-side -side comparison, right? It's a matter of taste. So let's pick this solution, knowing that this, of course, this is wrong, and submitting it. And Juice Shop will now explain to me why this is, of course, not a fix for that actual problem, right? So it has really no benefit. Um, to actually do this. So um, maybe this would actually fix the problem uh, or some problems with, uh, with, but only by coincidence. This is not really a fix. The obvious real fix was of course, number two, which just removes this crazy bypass of security, right? So you just use the parameter as is because in the case of this application, the framework being used, which is Angular, will do encoding by default. So here you basically have to, what, what we are doing here is we are turning off the encoding on purpose, right? And of course, then the recommendation is, guys, don't do that. For other frameworks, that might be different, right? So they might, might not encode by default and you would instead have to uh, do a manual encoding yourself. But luckily, Angular is quite sophisticated and is giving you proper secure defaults for this. So let's submit this. I get confetti again, and I also get a little explanation why this was the right answer, right? And that's basically the coding challenge part. For both uh, the coding and the hacking challenges, I can provide feedback with these uh, thumbs up, thumbs down buttons, um, which basically will send you to a Google form, and you can basically just leave a comment if you if you want what you liked or what you didn't like. So that's the coding challenges. Um, JuShop can do even more than, than all that. You can also use JuShop in capture the flag events. Of course, you could just use it as it is, but uh, we actually have a quite nice um, configuration change that you can make that will make juice shop emit uh, flag codes whenever you solve a challenge. And you can then copy that and could paste that into a central um, uh, scoring server. Now the question is, okay, how, how do I get these flag codes into my scoring server? Do I have to manually set up everything in my, um, in my score server system? Luckily you don't because uh, we support, um, three different score servers, more or less out of the box. And uh, you can quite easily set them up. So I, I will show that in a minute, how that actually works. Uh, another nice thing is you can of course host an a CTF event uh, centrally, but if you're doing just some, uh, just for fun event, people could even use Juice Shop locally on their computer 
and participate in a in an online hosted CTF um, as long as they use the correct um, key on the score so that is um, used by the score server to to generate these flag codes. So then you can basically even have decentralized CTFs. Of course, you should never do that for prize money or anything, right? Because then people can just cheat, of course. Um, to actually set up a CTF, you can use our uh, CTF extension, which supports CTFD, the by now I would say uh, really out of date Facebook CTF server. It's I think it's archived even already on, on GitHub, but it still works and uh, also root the box. So basically you just install a little uh, NPM module on your, on your computer or you use uh, the corresponding Docker image. And when you run this, you basically get a little command line tool where you have to answer a couple of questions. What framework do you want to use? Where is the application hosted? Where we can find actually the challenges, what key to use, et cetera. You can also choose if you want people to pay for hints on the score server or not, or if they should get no hints at all or hints for free. And then you will get a um, kind of a data dump being generated by this tool that you can then just import into the corresponding score server. So our recommendation is CTFD version, I think three or four at the moment. So version two, the, the screenshot here is, is a little bit older. Uh, and the root the box, right? So you just import it, and then you basically get um, get a working CTF setup. You can also run this tool in a um, headless mode, if you will. And in the end, what you get is a completely populated CTF environment with all the 100 challenges, with proper scores being assigned. So the one star challenges bring you less points than the five or six star challenges, right? Um, Hints also cost more for the more difficult ones. So if you read our documentation for this CTF setup, um, um, this is really in the, the actual time for, for setting this up is really just installing the server, running this tool, and then it's like five minutes for importing and uh, setting the, uh, doing some clicking through the user interface of the, um, of the score server and that's it, right? And then you have a completely working CTF setup. Some other support that we have for, especially for trainings, but it can also be nicely used for CTFs, of course, is the multi juicer platform, which is a third party project. Um, and this allows you to host, to spawn and host um, lots, of, uh, lots of juice shop instances for, um, on a Kubernetes cluster. So basically the setup looks like this. So you have this uh, Kubernetes cluster here. And when a person comes to the, to the entry point, which is uh, basically a, the UI on top of a custom built uh, um, load balancer, you, will, uh, you have the chance to, to choose a team name. And when you do, then you will get your own instance and the juice balancer will always, when you revisit, um, send you back to your own instance. You also get a code to actually um, have a second person sign up for the same team, right? Um, and you can have yeah, almost any number of uh, juice shop instances as much as your Kubernetes cluster basically can manage, right? So I'm doing, for example, next week, uh, a full week uh, online training for, um, for like 50 something people in, in my company. And then uh, we basically use multi-juicer for, to actually give everyone a juice shop instance. That's very convenient and yeah, very, very nice way to just quickly set up a complete training environment for multiple people. Some other features, um, you can, if you want, completely rebrand the juice shop. So you can make it look uh, like it would belong to your own uh, company, for example. So let me quickly show you how that looks like. So if you, let's go to the starting page here. So now we are on the default to shop theme, right? Keep that in mind while I kill the server and start it again with a custom, mm, custom theme or Mozilla in this case. 
So now the juice shop will start. And what it does behind the scenes always, also in the default configuration, it will check if, if your configuration is correct, if you're running it on the right um, uh, Java uh, Node.js versions, if your configuration is, is fine, if all the expected files are there and, and all that, if the port is free, etc. So now I have on my local host port 3000, the uh, juice shop just restarted. And because I didn't refresh my window yet here, um, it still looks like the default uh, theme, right? But one other thing you just noticed, um, during the restart, the juice shop has restored all my hacking progress from some cookies. Um, that's why you actually see these two uh, green pop-ups again, right? This is also very convenient. If your juice shop crashes, you just restart it and then everything will be back, right? As, as long as you uh, save cookies. So let's close these and now I just refresh and you will see a lot of things actually changed. The colors changed, the products changed, even the cookie banner down here changed, right? And uh, also for example, I think here in the support chat, I think also the image here for the, for the chatbot changed. If I go to the About Us page, for example, it now only has the Mozilla Twitter account. There's no more Facebook, Reddit, et cetera, right? So, um, so basically you can completely customize the juice shop. And the most impressive thing I think is that you can completely change the inventory, right? So there's uh, now, except for this one um, that you might remember, right? This 3D printing of the juice shop logo, everything is now Mozilla themed. And this is actually quite nice. And you can do that for, uh, for your own company, if you like, or for your university or whatever, some organization. Um, and it's quite well documented how to actually do this. Just to show you um, how sophisticated the customization actually works, uh, I actually created a different configuration for my, for my uh, company, the company I work for, but I didn't update that for quite a while. So if I use that, the juice shop will not start. It will instead emit some warnings about errors in the configuration, right? And it will also tell me where I find information, how to actually fix this. So it's actually quite, quite user-friendly, I would say. So let's start it again in the default setup and go back to the slides. So this is actually how the configuration looks like behind the scenes. So everything is part of one big YAML file where you, where we have the, the name of the application, the logo locations, um, the color theme, uh, all kinds of things, right? That the social URLs, etc. So it's all customizable via one one file, even down to the inventory of the actual shop. So you can define all your products um, there if you like. Okay, so that was basically the, the actual front end uh, or the, the user perspective of the juice shop. Um, all that I wanted to show. Now, just a little bit of background um, on, the, on the things behind the scenes. So the juice shop is, as I mentioned already, it's an Angular application using Angular 13 at the moment. Um, uses material design for the, for the look and feel in the Back end, we have a Node.js server. We're using Express, um, and we use a very simple, lightweight um, database with SQLite, which is connected to by our um, by by an uh, uh, object uh, relational mapping tool called SQLize. And uh, yeah, basically that's the main that's the main components, right? There's also a NoSQL DB, which is just running in memory. So it's this whole application is really so lightweight that you can just host it in a single Docker container. <clears throat> so there's no Docker compose where you have to spawn the database here and another database there, and then some load balance and that, that. And then you have like already like five containers running um, to actually have one juice shop instance. It's all in one. And it's really, really easy to install, right? You can either do it the way that I did. I'm just having the 
local installation. Just I'm I'm here in my uh, in my GitHub. Uh, I just cloned the repo and uh, just did an npm install and npm start, and then basically the juice shop was up. That's that's one way to actually do this. You can also use our Docker image, or you if you're uh, you like Vagrant, we also have a Vagrant file to actually spawn juice shop quickly. You can also use um, Heroku quite nicely. For that, you only need to go to the um, to the juice shop to the juice shop repository and scroll down to the setup. And here you find a button: deploy to Heroku. If you click on that button, you will be, if you're already logged into Heroku, it will just send you to a setup screen. And like two minutes later, you have your running running instance. If you are not registered at Heroku yet, you need to sign up for an account, but then still it's more or less register, sign in, click, running instance, done, right? So it's, it, it doesn't get any easier than that. But then of course it's cloud hosted. And if you want to, if you prefer to have it locally, of course you should, more look into the Node.js or Docker hosting. You can also do it with, uh, right, with Azure, Amazon, the web services, Google Cloud, whatever. So it's it basically runs everywhere, especially because if, if you're using the Docker image, then yeah, everywhere where Docker runs, you can make the Juice Shop run. Juice Shop also uh, has uh, multi-language support for lots of languages, actually. And we didn't look into this. Um, really, but I can show you that. So if I refresh again, oh, I didn't start the server, right? Let's see. Mm -hmm. Should be back up, right? There we go. Ah, okay, there it is again. Um, here, let's close that banner now. You can see here in the top right bar, you can basically select any language you like. The little thermometer here uh, indicates how, how complete the translations are. So for example, if I switch to German, it will now, some things will now immediately be translated, right? Um, some other things which came from the database are not, but if I refresh the, um, the screen, you will see that even the product names are now in German, right? So not all languages have this completeness. Um, for German, it's 100% because I natively speak German, so I always do that translation along the way. But we also have some other languages uh, um, where we have a very high translation rate. And for some, we have quite a good one. And for some, we have uh, just a little bit. So if you would like to help with the translation in the juice shop, we use actually crowd in to, to do this. And that's, yeah, we always appreciate help there. Um, also on the technical side, we have a testing pyramid uh, where we have some unit tests or quite a few unit tests with different uh, frameworks running. We have API tests uh, that actually uh, verify the, the, the integration layer, API layer of the Do shop. And we have end-to-end -end tests, which we are currently rewriting in a Google Summer of Code project from Protractor into Cypress. And these tests are quite nice because they actually don't test the functionality of the juice shop, the shopping experience, but they actually test the challenges. So they actually automate the exploits and then see if the scoreboard turned green for, the, for each particular challenge. And by that, we know when someone accidentally breaks a challenge with a code change. On the build side, we're using quite a lot. Our biggest tool at the moment is uh, GitHub Actions, of course, behind the scenes, everything from the whole Node uh, ecosystem is coming as well. We have some uh, some tests and uh, some tools being put on top, like Code Climate, for example, for quality and code coverage analysis. Um, also running some security pipelines on GitLab just for fun. And we even trigger uh, automated OWASP Zap scans 
um, on the uh, repository on, on the on the juice shops demo instance like every week I think. And we have uh, set a lot of these warnings to ignore because we actually want those vulnerabilities, which you normally shouldn't do. You can integrate the juice shop with other tools. Um, for example, we do, and I mentioned that before, we have a, a web hook that is triggered or that, that you can consume whenever a challenge is solved. So this emits the challenge name, um, the, the, the assumed cheat score for the challenge, but also in total for that user. And um, so you could basically in a, some central, I don't know, learning management system or something, you could record this. Um, um, Multi-juicers in the latest version, I think, I think it's based on this, I, I suppose, uh, to, to actually notice if someone um, solved a challenge as well. So that's uh, yeah, that's that's a nice technical integration that you can actually can actually use. You can also uh, use a template that we provide for a Grafana dashboard, where you can then monitor a juice shop instance. That's just to show you that real quick, because we are almost running out of time here. Um, this is the Grafana dashboard from the last, I think, seven days for the Juice Shops demo instance, which I'm hosting on Heroku. And you can see how many challenges have been solved. You can even see the, uh, the overall cheat score and you see that it went up and down a little bit, but you can also find some technical information about the request happening, et cetera. So this is all coming as a template that you can just install on your, um, wherever you want. In my case, this uh, Grafana dashboard and the, the um, Prometheus server to actually collect the metrics is running on a Raspberry Pi 24 seven under my desk, so. Okay, good. So we will not go through these um, FAQs here, but uh, you can find this presentation online. Uh, and also if you, um, want to find out more about, more details about aspects of Juice Shop, there's one really good resource which I can highly recommend. And that is our um, Owning Our Juice Shop ebook, uh, which you can just go through online. You can also download it from, from LeanPub if you want. Um, and here you find everything, right? From uh, the basics, to, I don't know, for example, here and complete instruction guide how to host a CTF with Juice Shop with most of the images you already saw with instructions for each of the um, supported frameworks, how to import everything there. Um, you also find a complete guide on customization, for example, right? So where we explain all the configuration values. So it should be really, um, if, you, if you like reading, then uh, afterwards you should be able to just set up your complete own. A juice shop theme with not too many issues, right? Then there's uh, hints and even full solutions for all the hacking challenges inside this book. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a very complete documentation, I would say. No, we wanted to skip that. Okay, so last actual content slide. This is actually my personal favorite slide of uh, every presentation. It's our success pyramid. So the juice shop across uh, over the eight years of its existence had uh, 84 contributors in total. It's an OWASP flagship project for since 2016, actually. Um, we even have uh, an open uh, source security foundation gold medal, right? Because we are such a great and secure application. Now the medal is actually for the for the more technical part, right? And for the um, for the for our um, how the way how we set up our uh, GitHub and how we manage pull requests and do continuous integration and all that. So, of course, this does not uh, take into account the intended vulnerabilities. Then it would probably not be a gold medal. For an open source project, I think we have quite a nice test coverage, although it was higher some years ago, and we try to get back there. And as you can also see, it's used quite a bit with almost 7,000 GitHub stars. Uh, quite a few downloads uh, in GitHub and also SourceForge. And the most crazy number uh, in this whole list here is the total of 48 million times the Docker image has been pulled. On the project roadmap, 
as I mentioned, um, our change from Protractor to Cypress for the end-to-end -end tests, I would actually like to get the code coverage or the test coverage back to 90%. And we would like to actually migrate our ebook to a more modern format because the current one doesn't get any support anymore. That's basically it. If you are interested in the project, um, here are the most important links. Uh, I guess because it's always, it should be obvious, everything here is open source, um, either MIT or Creative Commons license. Um, if you're interested in some additional nice things, which I published, um, I have a complete uh, IT security lecture uh, for two semesters on GitHub, which is an open, edu open educational resource. Um, and uh, in the second semester, basically, um, you, can, you can find a completely prepared training for, uh, for web security using the juice shop as, a, as an exercise environment. That's it. That's One minute great. overtime. That's Thank OK. You <laughs> Thank you. So I'm much. happy to take any questions. I do have a few here, so I will read out some of the questions that we've mm -hmm. received from some of the audience. So thanks very much for that. It was really interesting. And the first question we have is, do you have ambition to enhance Juice Shop or to prepare separate project more orientated to secure development, like coding challenges for multiple coding languages, et cetera? Uh, okay, short answer, no because this, this would just not be, this, this is just way beyond the scope, right? So our coding challenges, the way they actually work, I didn't explain that, they actually pull the, the real code from the server and display that in the, in the first screen where you have to select the, the broken line, right? The only thing that is hard coded for these challenges is the selection of, um, of fix files, right? So po the possible fixes. Everything else, the broken part is completely coming from the actual source code. And um, offering that in different languages, it, it would even be it would be decoupled from the real application, right? So if I if I'm if I'm using a JavaScript application and then I'm getting a Python coding challenge, there's no real uh, it would be really really hard to find to make the, the translate those very well and keep the um, connection. So no, that's that's not in scope for Juice Shop. Great, thank you for that. And then in similar vein, we have another question here saying, is Juice Shop finished or do you always add new challenges or features, et cetera? Um, actually, when the, when the latest OWASP top 10 was released, the 2021 edition, which came end of last year, I checked if I needed to add any new challenges to actually still uh, fulfill my promise of having everything on the OWASP top 10. And in this case, I didn't have to add anything because we already had the things that came into the OWASP top 10, right? Um, that might change. Of course, then we will definitely add, add those. And we, we um, yeah, we also have some sometimes on GitHub some nice ideas for new challenges. Um, I'm even at the point where I would actually like to retire some of the challenges because um, when you use the juice shop, you will see some of the um, some of the challenges are serious vulnerabilities. Others are more just for fun, um, and some of those, uh, yeah, well, let's say they are they are a little bit outdated by now, and could use a, could could use a, a replacement. But uh, I, I don't want to get below the 100 num the number of 100 challenges in total. So whenever we would want to remove something, we we would first have to add something new. Yeah, just one okay. example. We we always dreamt of having some uh, some some uh, challenges around uh, um, graph databases, like uh, attacking uh, GraphQL instead of having SQL injection. Um, but so far, for example, we, we have had no good idea to how to actually implement that. But we're always happy to take just challenge ideas or even implementation proposals. That's great. So if whoever's listening, if you have any ideas or proposals, please do put them forward, Bjorn. Um, and then another question that has just come in is, what do you test for using OWASP Zap? Are you testing whether the challenges can be found by OWASP ZAP? No, um, our, our ZAP test that we have set up is just using the ZAP baseline scan. So it's basically a, um, a prepared 
GitHub action from the Zap team that we just run and uh, we just point it to the demo instance um, and it will just do some, I think it's a two minute time boxed, very limited uh, scan. It will only find a few things because most of the juice shop problems are hidden very deep in the functionality. So it is quite hard to actually test the juice shop with some fully automated tools. So it's 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 already hard enough for, for a person sitting in front of it and trying to find everything, even with tools, but just point and shoot with some some tool, no matter if it's Zap or any other scanner. So far, th there were no no convincing uh, results from fully automated scans on Juice Shop, actually. So and th that's why we also have not included something like this in our own build pipeline, because that's we just would, would get the, let's say, the lowest hanging fruits, but even the medium uh, difficulty things would not would not really show up in most cases. Yeah. Okay. Now well, that makes sense. And then I guess another question is, so it has been, first, the project has been ongoing for the last eight years, as you said, at the start of the presentation. Um, how has it evolved? Okay. So what's so, the difference between then and now? <laughs> Yeah, um, if you want, if you want to try it out, you could also still find the old source code, and you could make it still run on a very old Node.js version. So when Juice Shop started, it was an Angular JS front end, so Angular 1.x version. And when uh, Angular actually um, jumped to the version two, it was a complete rewrite. So we actually had to do a complete rewrite of the front end. Back then, we also used um, boot Twitter's Bootstrap framework for the for the UI part for the for the screens, right? Um, and we replaced that then later on with um, with Material Design um, or Angular Material. Um, in the back end, I think we are actually quite stable. We replaced our our automated REST endpoint uh, generators like three times, I think. But for example, with the SQLite database, we remain stable since the beginning. Uh, we have Express we had uh, in there um, since since the project actually started. Um, yeah, so we replace whatever is needed to actually stay current. If now, for example, uh, Google would decide to completely ditch Angular and uh, come up with some completely different UI framework. I'm not 100% sure if, if I really wanted to do a migration of that because that would mean we throw away half of the code base and kind of start from scratch again. But uh, yeah, other than that, we try to stay current as much as possible, as you can even see with our um, attempt to to now uh, change the testing framework, right? Because the, the old one is not supported any longer. And so we we actually try to catch up and that's been working quite quite well so far. Okay, excellent. And then I guess the last question before we um, wrap up the session is how did you come up with the concept for Juice Shop? Okay, um, basically, I'm, I'm doing uh, web security trainings in my company for uh, like 13 years or something already. And at the beginning, I used existing broken web applications, for example, the good old budget store by Simon Bennett's, right? So more or less the demo application for OWASP Zap that I did use for 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 online tra uh, for in-house trainings. Of course, that only has like a little bit more than a handful or a dozen of, of security issues. So quite limited. Um, we also used some other third-party vulnerable apps, but none were really complete, right? Um, so that, Either they had a very limited scope and you couldn't really show all kinds of things with them and or they, they were like third party and you hadn't access to the source code and that also felt kind of wrong. And that's why I basically came up to, to write um, my own vulnerable application for my trainings. And I think we the first version already had like 20 something challenges built in and then it just uh, grew and grew and grew into, uh, into what it is now. But the main reason in the beginning was really just for my own for my own trainings, and Juice Shop existed already for one year, one and a half year I think around about before it actually became an OWASP project. So it came to OWASP as a finished project kind of.
but oh, when it when it came to OWASP, yeah. it really grew uh, quite a bit more and got a lot more contributors. So that's great. And um, thank you so much for the talk today. So I think that's a wrap. Um, it was great listening to you, and hopefully we'll see you again sometime. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Have a great day. You too.